Shalom. This week we are reading Parshat Naso, the second Torah portion in the book of Bamidbar, Numbers. We learned last week that Bamidbar means in the wilderness, the harsh no man's land that our forefathers are now traversing on their way to the land that Hashem promised to Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. Last week we talked about how, how conducive this environment was to receiving the Almighty's gift of Torah. You know, the wilderness evokes humility and it's ownerless and accessible to all. So it's a great equalizer. But it's also not a place to settle down in. Here in the wilderness, food and water needs to be provided miraculously. And in general, it's a difficult place to live in and full of dangers, scorpions and snakes and two-legged enemies that seek to destroy us. In such surroundings, one always has to be on one's guard. And most of all, as we will witness consistently throughout this entire book, the wilderness is a place of testing, and the test is always a matter of one's own free choice. King David's heartfelt, prayerful magnum opus, the book of Psalms, begins with the verse, fortunate is the man who walked not in the counsel of the wicked and stood not in the path of the sinful and sat not in the session of the scorners, but his desire is in the Torah of Hashem, and in his Torah he meditates day and night. A person is indeed fortunate if he or she realizes that the main thing in this world is to seek out the Creator in everything, to recognize and acknowledge and thank God and serve Him in everything we do. But how do we serve God in this fleeting, hostile world of illusion? That question is addressed by an unusual commandment that we encounter in this week's Torah portion the concept of the Nazir, translated as Nazarite, a person who declares a vow of abstention. This is a unique vow whose basic details are found in the beginning of chapter 6. The Nazarite seeks to limit his pleasure, even pleasures permitted by Torah. He seeks to get closer to God, and he feels that in order to do so, he must be extra stringent with himself, and so he embarks upon a period of abstinence, which will increase his separation from this world. Among other things, he vows to abstain from wine and any product of the grapevine which could lead to intoxication. And Torah considers his decision as an act not only of piety, but of holiness, as the verse states, for the entire duration of his abstinence, he is holy to Hashem. So there are many more details and rules clarified by our sages that pertain to this man or woman who has accepted upon themselves the prohibitions of the Nazarite. There's an entire section of Mishnah and Talmud called Tractate Nazir, that deals with all the issues. But as we see in the verses in our Parsha, the main prohibitions, which are normally permitted by the Torah for most people, which he or she takes upon themselves, are drinking wine or consuming grapes or any of their components, haircutting, shaving the hair of the head, and the prohibition of coming in contact with the dead. Maintaining purity from death at all times, as we've learned in the book of Leviticus, is a form of contact that's generally observed only by Kohanim, the priests who serve in the Holy Temple. So it's like, it's as if this person temporarily, or perhaps for an extended period, becomes like a Kohen serving in the Temple. And how long does this last? The Nazir usually takes upon himself this self-imposed period of extra abstinence for a certain limited period of time. Unless otherwise specified, the minimum period is the default of 30 days. However, it could be for a different amount of time or, or for multiple, multiple successive 30-day periods. And there's also such a thing, there is such a thing as a person vowing to be a Nazir for all one's life. At the conclusion of the period of the, of the Nazarite's abstinence, he has several obligations to fulfill. He's to bring three offerings, a sheep for an Ola burnt offering, a ewe as a sin offering, and a ram as a peace offering, together with a basket of unleavened loaves made of fine flour mixed with oil and unleavened wafers with oil accompanied by their meal offerings and libations. And after these offerings are brought, he's to cut his hair within a special chamber in the Holy Temple called the Chamber of the Nazarites. And after the attending temple priest and the Nazir together lift up and wave the prescribed offerings as a wave offering, the individual is released from his vow, and that which had been forbidden is now permitted to him again. At various times throughout history, there were actually many Nazarites, and it wasn't an unusual thing to make such a, a vow of abstention. While Samson Shimshon is the only Nazir identified in the Tanakh by name, it would seem that it was a popular practice in those days, as evidenced by verses such as Lamentations chapters, chapter 4 and verse 7, in reference to the citizens of Jerusalem. Her Nazarites were purer than snow, they were whiter than milk, their appearance was ruddier than coral, and sapphire was their form. 
And Samuel the prophet was also a Nazir from birth, like Shemshon. As the words spoken by his mother Hannah indicate in Samuel 1 and chapter 1, and no razor shall come upon his head. And our sages teach that Avshalom, King David's son, was also a Nazir. But now open up your heart in the deepest way. What does this word Nazir actually mean? According to Rashi, citing from the Sifri, whenever the word is used throughout Torah, it means abstention. And ostensibly, this person is called Nazir because he or she abstains from wine. Alternatively, according to Rav Hirsch, it's not the abstention that characterizes the Nazir, but the lifestyle of separation from other people. So making this Nazarite vow, accepting upon oneself these extra prohibitions, is the start of a dramatic life decision. And this code of behavior will have the effect of separating this individual from others. The world is too much with us, wrote the English romantic poet William Wordsworth in 1802. That sonnet is critical of those who are absorbed in materialism. Our Nazarite, who clearly feels that the world is too much with him, becomes stunningly separated and elevated above other people who are caught up in their physical desires and rooted in materialism. I say elevated because the word Nazir means crown. So in verse 7 we read, the Nazir, literally, literally the crown of God is upon his head. And Torah states here that he abstains for Hashem. So Rav Hirsch suggests that the Nazir is like a king with a crown. He's differentiated, he's elevated, yet markedly separated from other people. Now Torah does not specify why the individual chooses to become a Nazir. But there's a well-known teaching which points out the proximity in this portion of Nassau between the sections of Nazir to that of the Sotah, the suspected adulteress, which is the subject that immediately precedes the verses of the Nazir. The Sota is another story altogether, and we need another opportunity to properly understand its nuances and mysteries. But in the meantime, suffice it to say that in the case of a bona fide adulteress, we're taught that a main factor which led to her adultery and to her undoing was wine. Her unraveling is traumatic to behold. And our sages state, whoever sees the Sota in her state of ruination will vow himself from the wine. Scared straight, as it were, chastised by the sight of the sota's deterioration as described in our Parsha, the inspired onlooker is determined to take precautions to stay far away from the possibility of sin, even to the extent of swearing off wine. <clears throat> by Torah describing this Nazir as abstaining for Hashem, we understand that taking this vow is seen as an act of serving Hashem. But is it the thing to do? Should it be a first choice of one who seeks to serve Hashem? Our sages are divided in their opinions. Does the declaration of self-deprivation truly make the individual holier than the next person? Or is this individual perhaps considered on some level, perhaps on a very fine level, to be a sinner, declaring for himself that that which the Torah deemed permissible is forbidden to him? Is this the ideal, to separate oneself and behave with austerity, refraining from partaking of some of the permitted pleasures of this world completely? If this is the ideal, why doesn't the Torah command us all to be Nazarites and forbid wine for everybody? Is this maybe something only for certain people, maybe certain personality types, to be used under extenuating circumstances and only for certain times? Classic commentary Ibn Ezra explains that this person seeks to separate himself because he sees that the majority of the world follows after their desires and he vows to be a Nazir, choosing to distance, him, distance himself from physical desires and he does this to serve Hashem because he realizes that wine destroys awareness and without proper mindfulness, one cannot properly serve Hashem. According to this approach, the Nazir is holy. Indeed, the Midrash Rabbah states that on some level, the Nazir is considered to be like the high priest and is called holy. But on the other hand, in verse, chapter six and verse 11, we learn that the Kohen shall prepare one for a sin offering and one for a burnt offering and atone on his behalf for having sinned regarding the person and he shall sanctify his head on that day. What is the sin of the Nazarite who, who only ser sought to serve Hashem in holiness? Why does he have to bring a sin offering upon the conclusion of his Nazarite state? In the Talmud, the sage Rabbi Elazar Hakfar explains that this person afflicted himself by abstaining from wine. And the teaching there continues and states that if this individual who merely deprived himself of wine is called a sinner, how much more so is one who abstains from all pleasures considered to be a sinner? And from the law of the Nazir's sin offering states the Talmud, we learn that whoever fasts successively is also called a sinner. So it would seem that this is not the recommended path to serving Hashem, because to some extent, 
abstention and separation are considered as no less of a sin. And thus the Nazarite is required by Torah to bring a sin offering. But yet, Torah is teaching us that there can be a singular person within the, the context of a special situation who recognizes his own shortcomings, the areas that need fixing. This is a person who is seeking to make a very definite statement regarding his or her position in the world and how they wish to improve themselves. The Sefer HaChinuch explains that this person is also required to grow his hair long because cutting the hair represents a concern with physical appearance, an offshoot of the haughtiness associated with the evil inclination. The Nazir knows what his issues are, what he needs to strengthen, the areas of his behavior wherein he can't count on himself. So this is the type of person that was permitted to make a Nazarite vow of abstention. But he must remember that extra stringency is an emergency measure. It's not the desired way of life, but only a means to reach a specific goal. Acts of special piety are okay occasionally, temporarily, but not as a way of life. Torah did not normally forbid these things for everybody because Torah's path is not one of denial, of, of abstention and stringencies. This is the key to our understanding. We've always stressed that Torah is a celebration of this world, a celebration of creation and of life. Asceticism is not Torah's path. Its ways are ways of pleasantness and all its paths are peace, as we learn in Proverbs 3. Hashem created a world to be enjoyed, and He wants us to serve Him by finding joy in everything in this world, always according to His rules, and in proper measure and moderation, and by using it for Hashem's purpose, and thus elevating everything to its spiritual essence. Thus, regarding the Nazir, the Talmud states, Is it not enough for you what the Torah forbade for you, but you go and forbid things that are permitted? Maimonides expresses his opinion and his approach to this question. In the Hilchot Deot of Mishnah Torah, he asks, is it proper for a person to fast regularly as a means of serving God? A person could also say, since jealousy and desire and honor and the like are all destructive traits for a person and shorten life, you know what? I will isolate myself from all of this and I'll take the other extreme. I won't eat meat or drink wine. I won't marry or live in a nice place and I won't wear nice clothes. I'll wear harsh sackcloth like the pagan ascetics. And, continues Maimonides, he says, this too is an evil path and forbidden for a person. And whoever does so would be called a sinner. For regarding a nazir, the Torah states, and atone on his behalf for having sinned regarding the person. And our sages taught, this is all Maimonides, if the nazir who only separated himself from drinking wine needs atonement, how much more so does a person who denies himself everything? And thus our sages instructed that a person should only limit himself those things that the Torah itself withholds. And Maimonides quotes King Solomon's warning in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, do not be overly righteous. Rambam concludes all of this. He says the way that it's fitting for a person to go is the middle path, both in matters of one's temperament as well as one's actions. He says a person should not add to the list of that which the Torah forbids, he, he says, unless one sees that his desires are getting the better of him to the extreme, and then he should separate himself in an extreme manner temporarily as a device that will aid in returning to the middle path. So open up your heart in the very deepest way. Our goal is to find our path, to find Hashem in our lives and to serve Him through everything we do. The oppressive, hostile wilderness of Sefer Bamidbar is also the perfect metaphor for our world. It's a world of illusion and we're all just passing through on our way to where we're going. Our survival in this dangerous world is nothing short of miraculous, and it's a world of testing in which everything is left up to our choice. This world is a very narrow bridge, Rabbi Nachman teaches. What should be our path on this bridge? We could separate ourselves entirely from this world, and separating from the material is certainly easier, but opening up heart in the deepest way, it's a shortcut that can end up being the long way around. Avoiding the choices and tests of this world doesn't mean we deserve praise for passing the tests, because if we avoided them, we didn't pass them at all. In fact, if we weren't confronted with the test, who's to know that if perhaps in a moment of truth we would have failed to pass? The higher level and Hashem's purpose in creation is to serve Hashem through this world, this one right here, this very world that He created and in which He lovingly placed us, giving us the opportunity to raise up the material to His purpose and to sanctify the physical with our intent. Which is the preferable path? Without question, Torah teaches us that the purpose of creation, true service of God, is indeed to serve Him through this physical world and elevate it for the sake of heaven. 
And in so doing, our sages teach, we connect the worlds. We ourselves form the conduit, the bridge that can bring godliness into this world. Shalom, dear friends. Thank you so much for your support. We appreciate it so very much. It's only your support that enables Jerusalem Lights to continue its outreach of Torah for everyone.